Good morning. It's good to be here with everyone this morning. As John said, we want to welcome you into our presence here at College View. And if you're visiting with us, we're especially pleased with your presence and your interest in spiritual things. As we begin this morning, um, at the conclusion of our service in the back, we'll be handing out these brochures that talk about the work and our plans for 2016. So there's a lot to look at and to read and go through here. And you'll see a calendar of events on the back. And so there's a lot to go through. And I'm not going to go through that word for word. You'll be able to do that this afternoon in the quiet of your home. And if anyone certainly has any questions or anything, you know, would be free to talk about that and try and answer any question that you might have. So at the conclusion of service, be sure and pick up a brochure in the back that outlines our plans and thoughts for our congregation here, for the Lord's congregation that meets at College View for 2016. I wanted to take this, this opportunity to just spend time in the Word and to talk about our upcoming theme for this year, The Fields Are White for Harvest. Several months ago on a Saturday morning, we were meeting at Bobby's office, and our brother Mitch suggested, he said, you know, I think the verse in John chapter 4, where Jesus tells the apostles to lift up their eyes and to see that the fields are white for harvest. He said, I think that would be a good theme for this coming year. Having come off of this past year, 2015, our theme being always to be immovable, steadfast, and abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. And what greater labor is there than sharing the gospel, the good news about Jesus, and the fact that Jesus saves. So as we think about the coming year, we're going to focus on evangelism. For those of you that are visiting, like John said, Kenny Moore is our, our preacher. He's in Costa Rica this morning. Costa Rica is on the same time zone we are, and he's preaching a lesson this morning on evangelism and spreading the gospel to the world. Blake, our young preacher, is in Atlanta this morning, and he's working with the downtown church in Atlanta, and he's over there working as well. So this morning, I just want to go through John 4, not all of it, but a lot of it, and we're going to try and learn lessons about evangelism that Jesus shows us the great teacher that he was. The fields are white for harvest. And you might think, why did Jesus use that term, white? I'm not sure fields are ever white unless it's cotton. And I saw that for the first time when I moved to Alabama in 1981, and I actually pulled the car off to the side of the road, and Beth and I looked at a field that was white. But I don't think it was cotton in Palestine. But today we will learn why Jesus used the word white to describe those fields. John 4, verse 35. Do you not say that there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. That is going to be our theme for 2016. We all realize the work of a local church includes benevolence, edification, and evangelism. All are equally important. And while we will continue to be involved, obviously, in all aspects of the work of a local church, our theme for 2016 will focus on evangelism, to proclaim the good news about Jesus. In Luke 19, verse 10, proclaiming the kingdom of God, it gives us the mission of Jesus. You know, a lot of businesses and corporations have mission statements. Hospitals have mission statements. You know, this one simple verse could be viewed as a mission statement of our Lord for God's plan to redeem man. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This was the mission of our Savior and Redeemer. Since Jesus is our great example, then we must have the same mission as our Lord. We must follow him. We must be committed and have a concern about reaching the lost. 
Before we get into John 4, I want to kind of set the stage because I'm a visual learner. I like images in my mind. And I think it's going to help us understand the story if we can see where the disciples and where Jesus was as they were walking. We're going to read in John 4 that Jesus was in Judea. That's right down here at the bottom. And that he wanted to go to Galilee, which is up at the top, Nazareth. That's the area of Galilee. But there was this area called Samaria that was in between the two. On this map, you can see Judea, Samaria, and to the north, Galilee. And you see there two cities, Shechem and Sychar. Shechem plays a huge role in biblical history. And we're going to look at just a few of those points, not all of them. It could be a lesson on itself on the things that took place in and around Shechem in this pass. We see Mount Gerizim off to the left here, to the west. And the woman in John 4, she asked Jesus that question about worship, Jerusalem versus this mountain. She would have been pointing to Mount Gerizim. Bible history in Shechem, God appears to Abram. Genesis 12, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah, and at that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So there we see from the very beginning God's promise as he appeared to Abram was in this vicinity. And God showed him the land and made a promise to him that this would all be his offspring one day. Joseph was sold into slavery near Shechem. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. Covenant renewal at Shechem. This occurs in Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. At one place in the Old Testament it mentions that you'll see this pass, that the people were gathered and they read the law and they renewed the covenant. And the thought was, could people really have heard if they were on both sides of, of this mountain in this pass? And they've done acoustic research in this pass and it is exactly the way the scripture records, that speaking from one side to the other could have been possible that everyone in this pass between Gerizim and Ebal would have heard the word that day. Jacob's bones are buried at Shechem. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Joseph's bones are buried at Shechem. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem, in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. So a lot of biblical history has occurred in and around Shechem. In the New Testament, Jesus openly reveals that he is the Messiah near Shechem. I'm not sure if this was the first time. I'm not sure if this event occurred before his reading in the temple when he said, in your midst today the scriptures fulfilled. I'm not sure of the timeline between that reading and this occurrence but I know this was early in his public ministry during the first year in John 4. And it's here, near Shechem, at Jacob's well, where the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He openly declared that he was the Messiah, very plainly and openly. Not like his habit was in Jerusalem, in Judea, 
or in Galilee, where there were maybe Pharisees or Sadducees that could be witnesses in a Jewish court that could bring about a trial based upon sedition and have him executed by the Romans early. His time wasn't ready, and a lot of times Jesus never was that open and public. But this is a Samaritan woman. She would not have been allowed in Jewish courts as a witness. So Jesus just openly declared to her, I am the Messiah. Just like we find Jesus when he heals the man who was born blind, Jesus openly declared to him, yes, I'm the son of God. But that man had been cast out of the synagogue. So therefore, he was not a valid Jewish witness. He would have never been allowed into the courts in, in Judea, in Jerusalem. So Jesus openly declares himself. Hebrews, the word where Messiah is from the Hebrew word Messiah, the Greek equivalent is Christ. Here's another simple map that shows Jerusalem. Ephraim, the hill country of Ephraim, where a lot of things happen. And notice that Ephraim, you go to the right, the traditional route. That's the way Jews went to Galilee. They didn't want to go through Samaria because they didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans, the history there was bad, okay? And they didn't want to do that. But notice the path that our Lord and his apostles took. Not only did he go through Samaria, he revealed himself to a woman of Samaria at the well, at Jacob's well. And there we see the, the village of Sychar. This could have been the exact scene our Lord and his apostles saw as they were walking from the east toward the pass that Gerizim is on the left, Mount Ebal on the right, and that is the modern day city on the west bank of Nablus. And Nablus is built upon the ruins of Shechem. And Sychar was next to Shechem. Okay? As they get closer to that pass, you see Mount Gerizim on the left, Mount Ebal on the right. There is a closer picture. I know this is kind of blurry. It didn't copy and paste well. But there's the tombs of... Joseph and his bones, Jacob, Israel and his bones, and all the things that happened here. The covenant renewal as people were on the sides there and in, on the mountain. And this is the path Jesus would have taken to go to Galilee. And Jacob's well there is literally just a few hundred feet from the base of Mount Gerizim. This is a picture that was taken by Pharaoh Jenkins. It shows the ruins of Shechem right there in the foreground. And then in the midground of this photo is the modern city of Nablus. And then at the top there is Mount Gerizim. This is the modern city of Nablus. And notice the Greek Orthodox Church there. That Greek Orthodox Church is built over the site of Jacob's well. I read this is one of the few authentic sites in all of the Middle East where we can go and be assured this is the right place that the Bible talks about. The Sermon on the Mount may have been this mount, this hill, you don't know. The, the tours, I understand, will say this could have been the mountain. It was a mountain like this where Jesus gave that famous sermon. But Jacob's well, every archaeological Bible historian agrees is one of the few authentic sites and there have been different buildings erected over this site and this is what's there now. Here we see the city of Nablus in the West Bank, Old Testament Shechem, New Testament Sychar, Jacob's Well. Greek Orthodox Covenant, Jacob's Well. You go into this building and there's the ornate building. The building. Here's a mosaic in the floor of Jacob's well. And down in a deep crypt in the basement of this building is Jacob's well. We see there, they give tours. I'm sure they've commercialized it. 
And in the background, you see the picture of Jesus sitting at the well with the woman and her water pot. This would have been a more realistic picture of the steps coming down towards Jacob's well. Notice the mountain in the background with the little structure. Artist's rendering of Jacob's well. So this gives us some visual aids to have in our mind to help the story come alive when we think of Jesus and his apostles traveling along this road to Galilee and coming to Jacob's well. And the town of Sychar was about a half a mile away, okay? It was, it was a little distance, a walk, and it was separated by fields. So what are the lessons we can learn? We're going to study the text, but here I just want to get these in our mind, and there's a lot of them, so don't be overwhelmed, but we'll just take them in, and you can think about some of these as we read the text and go through it. Evangelism begins with a conversation. I know that's incredibly small, so you'll have to take my word. That's what it says. Evangelism must ignore cultural barriers. Sharing the gospel, we have to be content to teach only one person. There's nothing that takes the place of one-on-one evangelizing, one-on-one invitations, one-on-one sharing. You'll read in our plans, we talk about continuing newspaper ads, announcing sermon topics, the website, radio spots to invite, using various technologies to get the word out, which is, which is fine. But don't let that fool us. Nothing takes the place of every day. You and I, being spiritually minded, And when we're in contact with people, we think about offering an invitation. Come see what Jesus is about. Come see what a New Testament church looks like in the 21st century. That's all we're trying to be. So even though we're doing these other things, nothing takes the place of one-on-one teaching. The disciples went into the town of Sychar to buy food. They ran into all kinds of people. They taught no one. Their focus was physical. Jesus never entered the town of Sychar. He taught one person, and he converted the whole town. The power of one-on-one teaching. One person can open many doors, just like that woman of Samaria did. It involves teaching about the disease and the cure. Their conversation didn't start out that way. But when Jesus saw that she had an interest in spiritual things, by her question, I perceive you're a prophet. So this must have been a question that bothered that woman for many years. Because she immediately asked Jesus, you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem, but our ancestors have worshipped on this mountain. She would have pointed to Mount Gerizim. She had that burning question in her heart, okay? And she asked that of Jesus. And it's then when Jesus let her know that true worship in her life was going to involve surgery, moral surgery, to cut away the sin that she had in her life. It was then that Jesus would look at her and say, go get your husband. You know, after he talked to her about worship. So the disease is sin and the cure is Jesus. If people are not impressed that they have a problem, they're not going to be interested in any cure. You take someone who has a problem with alcohol, they're never going to get over that and and conquer that unless first they realize and admit they have a problem. And it's that way with sin. If we don't see ourselves as wretched sinners, then we're never going to be interested in any cure or treatment for the disease of sin. It involves sowing and planting. Here it talks about reaping, not in the sense of reaping at the end of the age, which the Lord's angels will do, but like Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered. Lifting up your eyes to see the opportunities around us, we have to see. They're there. We have to look for them. It involves the sense of urgency, 
In Corinthians, we're told that today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. It involves being willing to be inconvenienced. They had plans. Okay, they had plans, I'm sure. And they stayed there for two days. It creates in us a true sense of satisfaction. Remember what Jesus told them when they came back with the food? That's what the disciples were focused on. They were hungry. They were weary. Long trip. They're walking. They'd been preaching and baptizing, and now they're going to Galilee. They went into that town of Sychar to get some food, and they come back and they said, here, here, eat. We know you're weak. You haven't eaten much. And Jesus tells them, you know what? I've got food. I've eaten. And they, they were puzzled by that. Why? Because they weren't thinking in spiritual terms. Only thinking in the physical. The food, the spiritual food of doing our Father's will is the only thing that gives us purpose in life. The writer of Ecclesiastes knew that well. Solomon had more stuff than any of us could ever accumulate. He had more wives than any man has ever had. He had all sorts of things, but it was all vain and vanity. It didn't please him. It didn't create in him a sense of satisfaction. So, realizing what our food is and what gives us a sense of satisfaction is doing the work of, of Jesus having an eternal purpose which makes an eternal difference. So as we look at the text in John 4, verse 3 through 10, he left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay? He could have chosen to go around it like most Jews did, but, but they didn't. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus wearied as he was from his journey. Notice that. John said he was weary. This speaks to the humanity of Jesus. Only in the Gospel of John does John record the words from the cross, I thirst. Jesus was fully man. He was just like us. He was weary. Was sitting beside the well. Sitting beside the well. Again, a detail only an eyewitness could give. John was there. He was an eyewitness. He gave that detail. He saw his master sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There's debate and commentaries about whether this is Jewish or Roman time. And I think based on the story and all that happens afterwards with the multitudes coming out to meet Jesus, it would have been Jewish time. And that would have been, the sixth hour would have been noon. Roman time would put it at 6 p.m. At this time of the year, it would be getting dark. It wouldn't allow all that happens after this. So I think the sixth hour was noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Why is she coming to draw water at noon in the heat of the day? It's because she's an immoral woman. Her life, she's avoiding people potentially. She doesn't want to come there when there's a bunch of people. She's had a sad life. We'll find out she's had five husbands and she's currently living with a man. So she came out to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. There's the conversation. Jesus saw the common ground that he had with this woman. They both were thirsty for physical water. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So there we see the woman, her first ad address towards Jesus, how she first sees Jesus is a Jew. A Jew. Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. In 1722 B.C., Shalmaneser took the ten northern tribes of Israel and took them into captivity in Assyria. It left the land unpopulated. They then repopulated it with people they had conquered from many other lands. The wild beasts were just ravaging them. The king and the Assyria, they thought, well, maybe it's because we've upset the god of their land. So they send a priest back to this area of Samaria. And they just looked at the first five books, and that's all the Samaritans realized was or studied was the Pentateuch. And so it was somewhat Judaism, but not complete intermixed with a lot of pagan religion. 
And so there was always a sense that Samaritans were half-breeds. They really were not full Jews. And when they go to rebuild the temple in the south, the Samaritans want to help. But the, people, the Jews of the south said, no, thank you. We don't need your help. So a lot of animosity between Jews and Samaritans. And that's why it says here, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here, Jesus appeals to her spiritually to try and give her something that would help her spiritually. The woman said to him, Sir? So now she's gone from seeing him as a Jew, a Jew to a gentleman. Sir? And I think maybe that's because this woman in her heart, she did have spiritual ideas, questions about where to worship, even though she had led an immoral life. Jesus knew, knew her heart. And she said, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is d deep. I read that the well was seven and a half feet wide, 105 feet deep. That's, that's deep. And it usually had about 15 feet of water in the bottom of it. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? She goes back to Jacob, also known as Israel. They viewed, even though the Samaritans were not, in the Jews' eyes, fully Jewish, they viewed Jacob as one of their ancestors. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband. This is where Jesus makes her aware of her sin. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. So he didn't condemn her, even though she only told a partial truth. He said, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So now she's gone from, you're a Jew, you're a gentleman, sir, and now she perceives he's a prophet. So now that she perceives he's a prophet, She's going to ask him this question. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. That would have been Mount Gerizim. But you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And what Jesus is referring to here is the new covenant. The hour is coming. It was but four years away. This is in the first year of Jesus' public ministry. So he had two more than the death and resurrection. It was about four years away yet, but he said the hour is coming where the place of worship will not matter. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And that's true. And that's why Paul refers to the church as spiritual Israel. That's why in Galatians it talks about Christians being the seed of Abraham. We are spiritual Israel. Physically, I'm not Jewish. But spiritually, I am. I've been born again. I've been born of God. I've been saved. And that makes me spiritual Israel. The church here is spiritual Israel. We are seeds of Abraham. And he says, But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. You know, you can read a lot of commentaries that talk about God being a divine person. I'm not sure I've ever read anywhere in Scripture that it calls God a person. There are things that we read that say God walked here or there. God heard, God sees, God hears. In Isaiah, the right arm of salvation, it's attributes of a person. It's traits of a person. But we have to remember that God is spirit. He's eternal. He's immortal. He's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. 
He is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The place is no longer going to matter. In the new covenant, you have to worship God in spirit. As Romans 8 says, we're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So this woman goes from seeing him as a Jew, a gentleman, sir, a prophet, and now she talks about the Messiah. She knew. She was a woman who had had five husbands and was living with a man. She was immoral. She knew, but she knew spiritually there was a Messiah coming. She had that burning question of where to worship. She had a good heart. Jesus could see that. If we had a neighbor who we knew had five husbands, who was currently living, had had five husbands and was currently living with a man, I think most of us, including myself, would never view her as a good spiritual prospect. We probably would never invite her to a service at College View because we'd think that she won't be interested. She's had five husbands. She's living with a man. Not our Lord. Not our Lord. We need to be like Jesus when we evangelize. We need to sow seed. We shouldn't consider what soil type we think the seed is going to land on. We don't know. But this woman, she has spirituality in her heart. It was hidden and covered up by years of immoral living. But Jesus was able to bring it out. And so he openly declares to her, just then his disciples came back. They marveled. He was talking with a woman. That's because that wasn't done in the first century. You didn't talk to women in public, let alone a Samaritan woman. What do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her jar and went away into town and said to the people, look what she did. She was confronted with Jesus She came to an understanding that he was the Messiah, the Christ. She had come out in the heat of the day to get water. She drops her water pot and runs to the village to go tell her friends and neighbors to come and see Jesus. She was now no longer concerned about the physical, about the water at the well. You know, she had something much greater. And look what she says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Come see. There's going to be several Sundays you'll you'll read about in here throughout the year where Kenny's going to preach first principle lessons. Lessons on salvation. Lessons on the essentiality of baptism. Lessons that will be great for visitors, people who aren't familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ to come and hear. Those are going to be great Sundays for you if you've been studying with someone, trying to teach someone to invite them because you will know what the lesson is going to be about that Sunday morning. And so we'll make that, you know, it'll be announced ahead of time so you'll know. But these were the same words in John 1 that Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. In John 1, Jesus is walking. Two disciples of John had heard John the Baptist say, look, behold the Lamb of God. One of those disciples was Andrew. They asked Jesus a question. And Jesus says, come and see. The angel of the Lord said, come and see. The woman at the well runs back to Sychar and says, come and see. There's been surveys done on people that have come to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. And in those surveys, a lot of times, what starts it all is a simple invitation by a friend or family member. Don't underestimate the power of two words. Come, see. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And that's what Jesus is talking about there, what's truly satisfying, spiritual food. And, of course, the disciples didn't understand that. And, you know, they said, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me 
and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? That dates this episode to late December towards the end of January. The harvest in this part of the world, middle of April through the end of May. So that makes the timing of this event somewhere the end of middle of December, end of December towards the end of January. And Jesus is telling him, don't you say it's four months till the harvest? He's saying, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Okay? To understand that verse, we have to go back in this discussion. And she says, come see a man who told me that all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. What a vision that must have been. How touched our Lord's heart must have been. When he's sitting by that well, his disciples come back. That woman drops her pot, runs off to the village, and says, come see. And it says in other translations, a whole multitude was coming out. Jesus is sitting on the side of that well, and he looks at his workers his laborers, and he says, you all say it's four months till the harvest? Look, lift up your eyes. And at that time, they would have seen the multitudes coming out of Sychar across the fields to see if this was Jesus. The overwhelming color of clothing in that day was white. The tunics and the robes, because only the wealthy could could afford dye. So people, unless they were wealthy, didn't have purple robes, red robes, blue robes, green robes. They were white. Here was multitudes of people coming out of Sychar dressed in white. And Jesus sees that. And he's talking about a harvest of souls. Look, the fields are white. He's talking spiritual souls. The disciples, physical Food, here's some food, you're weak. You know, the harvest, grain. Jesus isn't thinking about the harvest of the grain. The harvest of the souls. That's what we want to be about this year in 2016. Spending time in the Word. We want to encourage home Bible studies. We want people to get together and study the Word. To equip each other. So we can go out on an individual basis and share the gospel. We want to encourage people to have Bible studies in their home, in their neighborhood, for friends, for relatives, people that you've come in contact with that need to know the truth about the gospel. Because life is short. We're all going to physically die. There was a lot more I had to say, but obviously time is going to... So those lessons, we've already, you can think about those things. Food. We all love food. Most of you right now are probably thinking, when is Randy going to be quiet? I know Joshua, my son, is. Not in a bad way, but like he said earlier this morning, he said, Dad, I know you. He said, you're going to have to be conscious of the time. And so, we'll end here in just uh, on a couple more slides. But food, we all love food. But we have to remember what Jesus said. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This should be our food. Jesus always had a spiritual mindset. Born again. His discussion with Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't understand. He was thinking in physical terms. Jesus, spiritual. Living water. We learn from the scripture that living water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Food. Jesus says it's doing the will of God our Father and accomplishing his work. Jesus was talking one time and they said, Hey, Jesus, your mom and brothers and sisters are out here. They want to see you. Physical. Not Jesus. Jesus said, Do you know who my mom and brothers and sisters are? They are the ones who do my Father's will. That's us. 
For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those are in the flesh cannot please God. If we set our minds on the flesh, and that's how we live our daily life, we're not going to please God, our Father. Aligning our will to His will, we have to realize God's intention, God's desire, and God's will is that none should perish. These two scriptures, and then we'll end. 1 Timothy 2.3 this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all. Now, the scripture didn't capitalize the word all. I did that. Okay, this is the English Standard Version. But I just wanted to emphasize that, all, to show you what it says, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is interested in all, any, and all, reaching repentance and being his children. And he puts that task in our hands of sharing his good news about his son and what he has accomplished for mankind through the gospel. So we will stop here. And as we think about our lives and whether or not we are doing that, we have to remember that our secular, what people call our secular lives, our secular job and spiritual, we can't view it that way. It's, it's one. What we do in the world, work, is spiritual work. If we're looking for every opportunity to be a good example, like Bobby taught us today in our adult Bible class, if we're like Deborah, and even sometimes without saying a word, at the workplace, they see how hard you work, how you do your job without complaining, how you're just the best employee that business has ever had. When they see our lives, the spirituality of our lives, that's what draws people to Christ. You know, it says in the scripture that when people come to you and ask about the hope that's in you, be ready to tell them. You know what? They got to see hope first. If we're like this, I doubt many people are going to come up and say, Man, Randy, what was so good about your life that makes you just every day just, you know? Nobody's going to ask us. So we all have struggles in life. Everybody's job is stressful, everybody has stresses within their family. Because we're human, we all sin, we all fall short. But we have to strive to do what is right. We have to strive every day to set our mind on the spirit and not on the flesh. So as we think about our family here at College View moving forward, it is our goal and aim, first and foremost, that every one of us that assemble here in the name of our Lord, that's a brother and a sister, that we love our Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we love each other as he has loved us. And in so doing, we help each other. We're there for each other. God's not going to open any doors of evangelism for a group that can't nurture young Christians and help them grow and to be mature. It all starts with us. And we have to do what we have to do. We have to be together. And then as we grow, and each one of us is evangelistic, just like the early church, they had no technology, but they evangelized the world in 30 years. That's what we have to do. So, as we offer the Lord's invitation, if there's someone here today that has not been born again, 
You've never been born of the water and of the Spirit. You've never had your sins forgiven. You need to come and partake of the living water, just as Jesus offered to the woman at the well as we stand and sing.